the magical history of mathematic blocks. Now, before we get started on this, I'd like to explain what I mean by magic. For me, in this case, magic is something that it just, how could it happen? It's such an unlikely coincidence. And yet, they all seem to be working towards math magic blocks getting out in classrooms and getting kids excited about math. Just to sort of set the stage, let me tell you one that happened recently. I went out to a, a Northern California Math Council convention at the Celebar, and you know, I rented a booth and was a vendor and almost made enough money to pay for the cost of renting the booth. But um, I'd never been out at something like this, um, and something had happened the day before I left, which was of no consequence. I've been teaching for 40 years, and a lot of times the name of a student just pops into my head. Um, Matt Gibson was a kid who just drank his head off in high school and then became a totally serious study bug and went to the top of his class at UCLA. Uh, Bryce Lundberg was a, a funny guy back in 1976 when I started working at Bakes High School. And a couple of days before I left to go to the conference, the name Vicki Knoll just went through my head. She was a student in my physiology class at Lodi back in the 80s. I didn't think anything of it. I just think about my kids now and again. So I went out and I set up and I was standing there trying to get people interested in these blocks and this middle-aged woman shows up and um, she says, you, weren't you my teacher at Lodi High School back in the 80s? You were my favorite teacher. You inspired me to go into teaching. And I'm teaching still, 20 years later, and I love it. And I said, really? Can I recognize her? But, I mean, you know, can't remember her name. And she said her name was, and it was the wrong name. But then she said, oh, no, I'm married now. But before I was married, my maiden name was Vicki Knoll. <laughs> what are the chances? So a whole series of really unlikely events have occurred. And I'd like to start off by talking about the very first one, which was the unlikely event that just in a flash of insight, I realized how I could make math magic blocks. It happened at Lodi High School in 1982, sitting around my classroom after school one day. And I made a set and they worked and I put them in a box and put them on a shelf. And for 25 years, they just sat there gathering dust. And then at the school I work at now, uh, the AP chemistry teacher decided that she didn't want to teach AP chemistry anymore. And I realized that AP chemistry is an important science. And if we don't have it in our school, we're having a big gap in our curriculum. And I like chemistry. So I said, well, I'll teach it. Well, they took me up on my offer. But I uh, realized, uh-oh, I don't know much chemistry. I mean, I took it in college. Uh, I took organic chemistry in college. But it's a long time ago. And the AP chemistry test is really famous for being difficult. In fact, there's a movement to make it be just the first semester of college chemistry because to cover the whole year is really difficult. But I decided I'd do that. And they luckily, uh, the administration suggested I go to a AP summer workshop so I could brush up on my chemistry skills. So I did. Uh, but before I left, realizing I was going to be the slowest kid in the class, uh, I decided to take along my little very dusty set of math magic blocks so I could show it off to them and maybe they wouldn't think I was a total idiot. So I took them along and about the third day of the conference I busted out the blocks and showed them to them and to my amazement they were they were just so excited. Bruce, you got to produce these blocks. These blocks teach mathematics so well that my chemistry students will understand how to do the chemistry they need for math with the help of these blocks. So I thought, wow, that's pretty high praise. And so I ended up making math magic blocks uh, because of that. It took quite a few years to get the full set together, um, but I did. And then I was worried that I might actually, you know, um, it's a cool idea. Someone might steal it. So I thought I should patent this idea. But patents are expensive. I mean, thousands of dollars to hire a patent attorney and whatnot. 
So back in my mind, I'm thinking, well, someday I'll have to fork out the money. I'm a lucky teacher because every year I get two class reunions. I get the 10th reunion, the students I had 10 years ago, and also the 20th reunion, and sometimes the 30th also. So I love to go to these reunions and see my old kids uh, who are now you know, responsible tax-paying adults and whatnot. Well, I went to my 10th reunion, or the kids' 10th, and I met a kid named Ryan who had been teaching physics, but he quit because he was just really treated poorly by the school he was uh, working for and decided to become a patent attorney. Well, when he said that, I thought, wow. You know, I have this product. It's called Mathematic Blocks, um, and I'm trying to get a patent for it. And I explained it to him. He kind of understood it, and I thought, you know, Maybe I could show it to this guy's boss. And he said, sure, bring it on in sometime. Well, I took it into Andrew Fortney, PhD and uh, attorney also at law. It, uh, Andrew's a really sharp guy. So I took it in to show it to him. Now, I, maybe I just don't understand the way it works as a patent attorney, but I'm guessing it's, a lot of times it's pretty dry. You have to read it with a fine tooth comb, get everything just right because you're patenting something. A lot of money hangs in the balance. Well, Mathematic Blocks was a really fun, creative, exciting thing. It, it just, Andrews lit up when he saw this thing. And he ended up saying, I'll patent it for you for free. Well, sounds good to me. So he wrote up the patent and um, we sent it off to the USPTO <coughs> in Washington, D.C. and awaited the you know, acceptance of the patent. Well, Andrew called me a couple of months later and said, they rejected the patent there's already been another patent for this concept. And Andrew was mystified because he had done a thorough patent search before he even spent all the time writing the patent. But it turns out that there was a guy named Lin who had come up with the patent first. And <clears throat> uh, Andrew found out about that when he went and talked to the uh, you know, patent examiner. So he came back and he studied the Lin patent and realized, wait a second. This is bogus. So here's Lynn's patent. What he has is a balance, just like my balance. <clears throat> and instead of having like, you know, a one and the two being the same size, a one is like this and the two is two ones glued together. So one, two, all the way up to 10, you can visually see that. So it stops short of requiring that students have this abstract understanding. You can tell that this is bigger than this one because it's bigger, but it's a level of abstraction to know that this is bigger than this one. So what he did was he had these balance and he had these blocks, and then in the actual patent application, he has a picture, and it helpfully shows that two plus three equals five. And he actually has a picture of the two block and the three block. And then he shows that on the other side of the balance, there's a five block and it balances. Okay, sounds good. Kind of a no-brainer, but you know, that's an important thing to do. But then on the next page, he says, and you can do multiplication too. And what he does is he says he has a picture of a two block and a three block. And he has an X in between them. Two times three equals six. Isn't that great? Two times three equals six, except you're adding the weight of the two block and the three block, and they don't weigh six, they weigh five, Lin. So he had this bogus idea of multiplication and addition with the same blocks. The USPTO didn't see that it was bogus. They awarded the patent to this guy, and so therefore we can't patent the idea. And they don't even appreciate the brilliance of mathematic blocks. Well, Drew was upset, to say the least, but he doesn't take things lightly. So he said, I'm going to fly back to Washington, D.C., and I'm going to visit with that patent examiner, and I'll explain to her. You know, I'll just show her. So I took my Mathematic block set, which was still kind of dusty, but blew the dust off, gave him a scale, he got in the plane, flew to Washington, D.C., and then he 